you. Uh, so we're going to start with Luke chapter 1, verse 26 through 45. And Stacy, you're going to read for us. I'm going to point it at you so you can, uh, they can see you. And I'll ask that we stand during the reading of the scriptures. Go ahead, Stacy. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. The angel replied, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby to be born will be holy and will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has been pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son and is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. A few days later, Mary hurried to the hill country of Judea, to the town where Zechariah lived. She entered the house and greeted Elizabeth. At the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greeting, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believe that the Lord would do what he said. Thank you, Stacy. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God indeed. Okay. <clears throat> so since we're doing this live and we're doing it on Zoom, uh, if anybody wants to talk up, um, don't forget to unmute yourself. I, I think that uh, Pastor Larry has taken us on a pathway for Advent. And at the top of your outline, I wanted to put down some of the definitions of Advent so we would all kind of be able to put our arms around that. So think of it as the coming of the Messiah to prepare and remember the birth of Jesus. We're waiting for the preparation for both the celebration of the nativity of Christ, the birth of Christ, but also the return of Christ in the second coming. So uh, Advent has a multiplicity of definitions and meanings. All of them are worthwhile and important for us to kind of come to grips with. So this actually is the first Sunday in Advent. And so uh, we want to make sure we understand why we're celebrating that. Now, um, in this story, remember that as, as we think about uh, Mary, she was betrothed, which means basically in our terminology today, our common syntax, we would be saying she's engaged. But in Jewish tradition, to be engaged meant they were not yet coming together as man and wife. Uh, they were separate, still living separately, but they were pledged or betrothed, which means that it was the same as them being married. So literally, for them to break that engagement would mean they would have to have a writ certificate of divorce in Jewish tradition. They'd actually have to be divorced, even though they technically weren't married yet, because that's the way Jewish tradition was. Um, so... You also have some other characters in the story, as, as Stacy read to us. Um, Elizabeth would be a relative, uh, Elizabeth and Zachariah. Zachariah was one of the priests. Remember that he was, uh, he was on duty. The priest would be on duty in Jerusalem every uh, on a rotational cycle. He was there. And then they would draw straws or lots to see who would go into the most holy of holies and would offer incense and an offering and prayer of forgiveness for the people of God. They would go behind the, the big curtain that was in the Holy of Holies. And Zachariah's straw or lot was drawn. And so he would actually go in there, which was a huge honor. And, and many priests 
in their whole lifetime of service would never have that opportunity. Only one could go in and on a very rare occasion. So he goes in while he's there, an angel of the Lord appears to him and says, um, you know, you and your wife will be having a child and he will be the, the forerunner of the Messiah, uh, the forebearer, some, some translations would say, or the, the messenger of the Messiah. And Zechariah kind of questioned as a result, um, the angel of the Lord said, well, since you didn't believe everything I'm telling you, you're not going to be able to speak until the baby's born. Okay. And um, so Elizabeth is pregnant with who? John she, the right. John, who eventually becomes John the Baptist. So John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins. Okay. Just so you'll know that. And John the Baptist is about, is about six months older than Jesus is. We don't know how much time they spent together. We don't know if there was family reunions and, and John the Baptist and Jesus played uh, football on, on Thanksgivings or not before, uh, before they, they came to the time of where John the Baptist baptized Jesus. Um, so we don't know the, the story there. We just know that they are relative of each other. And so uh, there's some great, great things that Pastor Larry mentioned in the sermon today and I, I hope we can pull some of those out today. So let's look at our outline. Let's start with, um, with verse 28. So uh, Gabriel, who is the pronouncer, he is one of the uh, high angels of, of, the, the, of, of God. And so you often hear about Gabriel, who's the pronouncer. He's the one who announces a lot of things for Jesus. This is also the same angel who appears to the shepherds when Jesus is born. OK, that night of the nativity, uh, Gabriel's the one who appears to them, uh, to the shepherds. And so he's the messenger of God. Uh, Michael is known as one of the archangels as well. And Michael's the one who is is often the warrior angel, uh, as you read about that. Uh, so Gabriel appears and he says something that's very unique. He said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And so I asked this question, have you ever received this kind of greeting? No, we haven't, right? Um, it's kind of a special greeting, and, and there's depth here. Um, so I want you to appreciate that Mary is a um, what we would call today one of us. You know, her family is not in the royal line, per se, Um she has no special talents or abilities. She has no special title, no special education. She is, as some people would write, she is a commoner. Okay, she's a commoner. But look at the, the introduction. Um, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. And I, I want you to see this. I, there's a, a popular Christian song that's just kind of making the charts now from uh, uh, Tasha Layton. And it's called Into the Sea, It's Going to Be Okay. And the refrain in it, it's going to be okay. I can hear my father singing over me. It's going to be okay. And, and so I want you to recognize that, that we have a God in heaven who uh, does sing over us. Okay. He, he does look over us. And granted, you and I haven't heard <laughs> greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Um, I think now's a good time as, as the Advent season starts for us to recognize that God is looking over man. Okay, and that was the whole plan of Advent is that God would be looking over man and looking out for man. Uh, so 30, 31 and 32, um, let me read it to you quickly. Um, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You're to call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And so part of the Advent is recognizing the promise that God brings to us. And if you note in this scripture, the angel is talking about the promise of mankind here, okay? And he's talking about Messiah. So Pastor Larry, during the Advent season, is using Adam Hamilton's book called Incarnation. And um, 
Adam Han Hamilton really is a lover of the Christmas season. We've done a couple of studies as a church from Adam, Adam Hamilton's previous books. Um, and, and in this, Adam Hamilton is using all of the titles that you find primarily in the Gospels, but they're throughout the New Testament as well, and even some in the Old Testament that actually give titles to God or to Jesus. And so uh, you would know them. The, the Jewish term is called Messiah. And when that's translated to Greek, it's Christos or Christ. That's where we get. So Christ and Messiah are the same terms. Okay. One happens to be Hebrew or Aramaic and the other is Greek. And then when we translate Christos to English, it becomes Christ. So um, there is a title that is beginning to develop here. And Adam Hamilton and Pastor Larry are going to focus on those titles. So for the first Advent, uh, first Sunday in Advent, it's really about the Messiah, the Christ, the King. Okay, because that's who's coming. And the, the angel Gabriel actually talks about that. You know, he, he talks about the fact of he will be great and he'll be called son of the most high, which the term is Messiah. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. So, you know, he's setting up this kingship that, that Jesus represents here. Then in verse 33, there's another promise. Look what it says. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. So I want you to think about the concept for the Jew, because as the Jewish people are expecting the Messiah, they're expecting a king. They're expecting somebody from the line of David, because remember David, um, as we talked about, if you look at the Israeli flag today, it, it, it has some a symbol on it. What is that symbol? Star of David. It's the Star of David, okay? Today, he's still the great king of the Jewish people, of the Israeli people. Um, you know, they, they, they just believe that he is the epitome of the great ruler and king. And so, um, in fact, in their, um, they don't call it um, inauguration, I guess, but when their prime minister comes to power, um, they talk about the line of the King of David and the responsibilities that they have as leader of their country. Okay. So the, the King of da the King David is still very important to the Jewish people today, but I want you to see this, that there's a promise to the, to all people, all believers and to all the world that he will reign forever, right? That he will, his kingdom will never end. And that's an unusual way to look at kings because we normally think in a term, in a, a time period. Uh, President of the United States is four years, right? Congressman is two years. So when you begin to see those things, you always think in, in, in terms of a term. And here the angel's talking about this thing called eternity. And that's going to be different for a lot of people to begin to think about. And so at Advent time is a great time for you to be thinking about eternity. And so what is your place in eternity? As a person of faith, we begin to understand that we are about eternity, right? Um, so some of the things that we do on earth actually affect eternity. It's kind of cool to think about that, isn't it? So if you think about that, um, some of the things that you and I do, and frankly, don't do, affect eternity. How does that happen? How, how do we affect eternity? When we start thinking about that as Christians, how do we affect it? Well, if you bring people to Christ, you're going to have more people that are going to see eternity. Yeah, that, that's great. So Stacy said, if you bring people to Christ or you introduce Christ to them, uh, your effect in eternity um, for them and for others. Absolutely. So, so think of a visual here. Um, think of a very still body of water and you throw a single pebble or rock into that water. What goes out from it? Concentric rings, right? It's just ring and ring and ring and ring and ring and ring. And, and it continues to expand out and, um, 
Uh, I was told once by a physicist that if you could do that exercise on a really big body of water, that literally it would go to infinity. Now, I don't know how you prove that, but that's what he said. He said the energy from that pebble splashing in there, even though it may not be visible to the eye, it affects the surface of that water as far as it can ever go. So think of your own life, that there are times in our lives when we have an opportunity to be that pebble on that body of water we would call infinity. We have a chance to affect infinity here just by an action that we do or don't do. So um, I think Mary begins to see that. She begins to understand. That's why she asked the question in 34, uh, you know, how in the world is this going to be? I'm a virgin. I can't have a child. I'm not married yet. So in your outline, we then go to 35. And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you. Some of your translations will say, will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. All right. So the angel is very descriptive here in making Mary understand she's going to have the Messiah. All right. There's, there's no hinting here. The angel, Gabriel says, you will have the Son of the Most High. All right. Now, can you imagine, a, you know, it's it's calculated by a lot of theologians that she's probably 14 years old, somewhere like that, which was not uncommon for them to be married at that age. So you think about that. Um, what would that be today? A 10th grader? Ninth grade, 10th grade. OK. Or in the Rinker wrinkle household, 14 years old, be second or third grade. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, think think about that. So we have some promises that, that Advent brings to us. We have some promises that Gabriel made. And I want you to appreciate that, that Gabriel is talking to Mary. But the, the author captured, Mark and Matthew both captured this so that Humanity forever gets to hear that story, and we become part of the story. So Advent is not just that we're standing on the outskirts looking at the story of Mary and Joseph only, but we've been drawn into it. And Pastor Larry mentioned that to us today, that we've become part of the story, right? We've become part of the story as, as Christians. But 35 becomes that concept of the virgin birth the virgin birth. And I want you to think a little bit about symbolism for the virgin birth for a moment, because um, that becomes important to kind of your foundation of your faith, All right? There, there are a lot of things that people who are agnostics or atheists, um, they will try to do to the Christian faith. And, and so they try to shoot down some of the foundations of the Christian faith. And the virgin birth is one of those concepts that becomes important. Now, we're not going to go too deep into this, but in your outline, I put some symbolism that's here. Number one is there's the concept of sin. There's the concept of sinlessness, the concept of fully human, and the concept of fully God in just a couple of verses here. Now, I know we're not in seminary, so we're not going to go too deep, but I do want you to understand that... Um, the angel Gabriel, through the words that God gave Gabriel to share with the world and with, with Mary, um, it was no accident it was described the way it was. It was no accident that God brought it in the way it is. Um, so here's a concept for you to understand. That when Adam was created, he was created sinless. When he was created, he was created sinless. But because he did what? He brought sin into the world. What did he do? Yeah, he, he had the free will. God gave him the free will like we have to make decisions. And his decision was that he would choose not to follow God's plan, but he would create his own. Okay. And you can say that Mary was in, uh, um, um, Eve was involved in that. And yes, Eve was. That's true. But man 
was the one that sinned. God did not create a sinful man. Man became sinful by choice. Okay? So if Jesus was born by man, okay, and not by God, he would come from a sinful line. Okay? Because we are born of men and women, okay? Um, in fact, the Bible describes it as the choice of a man. In other words, by a man and woman having intercourse, they become, we become sinful. We're part of that sinful generation, all right? But God broke that, that bond here. He broke that, that chain of command, if you will, or the chain of, of genetics, so to speak. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who created Jesus within the womb of Mary, all right? So the thinking is, and the understanding for everybody is, is that Jesus was born sinless, whereas I'm born sinful because I come from the lineage of Adam. Make sense? Okay. It, it does become important because those who want to shoot holes in Christianity will often say, well, I, I can't believe in the virgin birth. I can't possibly happen. And then if you want, if you want to just argue with them or debate with them, which I sometimes enjoy doing, you ask them what miracles they do believe in. And, and many times they'll believe in certain miracles. They, they will believe in certain miracles. But for some reason, the virgin birth is too much of a miracle for them. So you, do you believe in the miracle of, 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 of that God created the world? And many of them will say, yeah, I think it kind of matches with science. So so you believe that God can create something out of nothing, but yet you can't believe that the Holy Spirit placed Jesus in the womb of, of Mary. So it's a great way to, for you to begin to understand your basic faith, all right? Now, the symbolism also is, remember, that since he was not born of Adam, not of man's choice, he was born sinless. Now, here's the other concept that you need to grab out of this. That because God placed, the Holy Spirit placed Jesus in the womb of, of Mary, he was fully God. But because he was born of a, of a woman, he was fully human. One of the mysteries of our faith is, how can Jesus be both fully man and fully, and fully God? And that's some of those things that we talk about from a faith perspective. Concepts hard for us to imagine, just like uh, the Trinity is hard to imagine. If Stony Croson was sitting here, he'd still be raising his hand. Remember, it's a, you know, Stony and I always go back and forth on the Trinity, and and it's difficult to comprehend how can God be God and yet He's the Father, He's the Son, and He's the Holy Spirit, right? And some of this is really beyond our imagination, and so that's kind of the faith kind of concept that we have. So. Jesus human, Jesus God. And then I ask the question on your outline, what about us now? As we become people of faith, as we accept Jesus into our life as our Lord and Savior, what about us? Are we human? Are we, are we godly? Or are we more like Adam? How do you answer that? If somebody says, well, um, if you have the Holy Spirit in your li life, what does that make you? It makes you holy, Laura says. How does it make you holy? So because of the blood of Christ, you become holy. Correct. Okay. And that's scriptural. Anybody else? So, so here's important for you to, to again, to, to be able to articulate your faith is that when we become a believer in Jesus Christ, we have a, a very churchy term, you've been washed in the blood of Jesus, right? Because you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you, you suddenly have God's Holy Spirit indwelling in your life, in your soul, bonding with our spirit so that we become uh, holy in the eyes of God, all right? 
So to some degree, we become a little bit of that fully God and, and fully human, not by our own power, but by the gift of God. And so as you articulate your faith to others, they'll say, but, you know, you're just a sinner. And, and, and that's right. The human side of me is, is the sinner, right? But I have part of God in my life now. Part of God's in my soul. And that part and the fact that Jesus died on the cross for me does make me holy. So when Doug's in charge, there's no holiness. When God's in charge, there's holiness. Okay? So I, I've shared this story with you. Um, my dad looks at my son, Daniel. He calls him DW. That's his initials. And he says, DW is almost perfect. Now, you know, I have a list of things that my son has done that can prove he is not perfect. Okay. I, I know he is not. But in my dad's eyes, he is almost perfect. In fact, if uh, my son to this day, who just turned 35 on Friday, if he makes a mistake and my dad hears about it, he says, it's okay. It's DW. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. Okay. So love that my dad has for his grandson is so great that he looks past those things that he does wrong. We have a God in heaven and Advent time is a perfect time to remember this. That we have a God in heaven that way with us. When he filters the way he sees us through Jesus Christ and through the blood of Christ on the cross, he looks at us and says, you know, there's Anita. She's perfect. There's Joe. He's perfect. There's Pam. She's perfect. There's Bob Curd. He's 75%. Yeah. So you see how God is seeing that? God is looking at us through those lens and he says, wow, that person is perfect. Not because of something they've done, but because of something that he has done. And Advent's a beautiful time to remember that the Messiah, the Christ, the King, Jesus came into the world for that. Now, verse 37, I want to draw your attention to. Um, a lot of your translations will say here in verse 37, the, the angel Gabriel these are the last words that he says to Mary, okay? Uh, for nothing is impossible with God. But the, the most current translation of the New International Version says it this way. For no word from God will ever fail. I want you to hear that again. For no word from God will ever fail. Um, Isaiah the prophet said that no word of God will ever go out without coming back with something. In other words, that when God's word goes out, it doesn't go out empty. It comes back full. It comes back with something. Um, I, I, I have some people in my life like that. When I talk to them, they share things with me and it always enriches me. There's some people like that. I mean, what they say to me, I always get something out. Pete Ford's that way with me. When I talk to him, he says something, and it always helps me. Always. Always. And I have other mentors in my life like that. So if you think about that, it's really cool to think that no word from God will ever fail. And I believe if that is still true today, not just for Mary, if that's true, I ask this question on your outline, then what promise will you hold on to? What promise will you hold on to? If God's word will never fail, is there a scripture that you're aware of that helps you through the day, through the week, through the month, through the year, through your life? If it is true that God's word will never fail, then how about for you? Is there, is there a part of scripture that you hold on to and you can accept that God's word will never fail? And, and another way to say that is nothing is impossible for God. And maybe on the first Sunday of Advent, 
if you leave today or you cut off a Zoom today and you really can believe that no word from God will ever fail, then that might be the hope that we need to make it through life. One old country preacher that was a, a Methodist lay speaker, he, he, he was a lay speaker in the Methodist church till he was 92 or three. And he's been gone for about 20 years, but um, he always joked. He said, you know, I'm barely going to make it, but he said, I'm going to slide in under the line. And, and uh, he, used to, he used to say that, but then he'd get real serious and say, and he would use this verse, um, but he was a King James kind of guy. And, and so he kept talking about the fact that nothing is impossible by the word of God. So I want you to appreciate that uh, whether you read it for nothing is impossible with God or for no word from God will ever fail, uh, there are promises in scripture that can help us live life, okay? To help us be more fully God instead of fully human. And then verse 38, um, this is what Mary's response is to Gabriel. I'm the Lord's servant. Do you hear the submission there? I'm the Lord's servant. You're the boss. Hey, you're in charge. I work for you. You're the commander in chief. You give the order and I'll ask how high. So think about that. That's so a 14 year old, let's say. Um, that's that's pretty impressive. And then she goes on to say, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I imagine you do at home, Rusty, but not in public. Um, so think about what else she says. May your word to me be fulfilled. So I ask in your outline, may your word to me be fulfilled. Does this still apply to us now? Are you willing to have that attitude toward God in your life? So as we prepare our lives and ourselves as people of faith for the Christ child to come into the world, right? As we prepare for the Advent season, are we willing to ask this question? Are we willing to say to God, your word be fulfilled in me? I'm willing to do what you ask me to do, God. And then here's what I said in your outline. If Jesus is really the Christ, then what word have you received that must be fulfilled? Each of us will answer that differently. So it's not fair for me to look at you and say, well, what is it for you? Um, well, it may be fair, but it might not be easy. And so I encourage you as you think about this, Advent season's a great time to say, well, if your word will never fail, God, if nothing is impossible for you, if the power of the Holy Spirit's in me because of my faith in Jesus, then may your word be fulfilled in me. And what is that word? What's that word for you? I, I don't know. As I've shared with you before, my testimony is at times I struggle to figure out what that call is in my life. And you'll just have to figure your own out. But do not make this the ark. In other words, it doesn't take um, 110 years to build this, okay? It, it may be that daily you're just sensitive to being aware that God's in your life and that what do you do to fulfill that responsibility or that call? And it could be little things, not giant things. It's texting somebody. It's um, it's. Kim and Steve Campbell taking care of other people. It's us praying for Kim Campbell tomorrow during her surgery. Um, you know, it's, it's those kind of things that we do a little bit at a time that makes a difference versus trying to build the ark. And Advent season is a great time to be called to that and remember that. So, so Adam Hamilton and Pastor Larry through his sermon series is telling us that we've got the king. 
He is the Messiah. He is the Christ. And since no word from God can ever fail, what's the promises you want to depend on? What's the promises you want to depend on? He promises us he will fulfill his word. We have to be open to it. Be open to it daily. Sometimes it's not a huge thing. Sometimes it's little things. What will you do? And at the very bottom of your outline, I put in italicies just as a reminder for no word from God will ever fail. And I put a question mark. Because if you believe that, then what will you do about it? What will you during Advent do about the fact that God's word never fails? Which means we're part of that. We're part of that promise. Let's end the word of prayer. Father God, thank you that we could both be on Zoom and we could be in person. Lord, we just ask for your blessings and that during Advent time, we will be the kind of people that will help fulfill your word by the things that we do. Because just as Jesus came fully human and fully God, we've got God inside of us. Help us to recognize that and to use that gift of the Holy Spirit in our lives so that we would change the lives of others. That during this Advent time, we would see our purpose and our call. And we'd be faithful to it. And Lord, we also lift up Kim Campbell for her surgery tomorrow and ask not just for success, Lord, but that it become that miraculous thing that all of us hope and pray for. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being online.